where's your mind at where you think I want to look for an agency versus I want to bring somebody in house for a role? What makes you start to uh, kind of look for that agency partner? Well, if we're speaking on behalf of creative, which we are right now, finding creative resources, I think, is one of the hardest things because there's such a deep level of subjectivity that exists within creative selection. Um, that is in particular pertaining like to, you know, down to like just the type of creative that you want as the brand. Right. And so mm -hmm. I guess to answer your question about um, what makes me decide to go in-house versus brand or versus agency is just the amount of resources that I need. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes, if I, uh, for example, I think the most recent example is just hiring for a social media content agency. Um, we've tried in the past to hire in-house and build a content strategy team, but the reality is we would end up building an agency within a brand. Mm. And so there, you're, you're asking for a great creative lead to manage all those resources and kind of lead it forward. And oftentimes that just turns into an agency in and of itself. So in a situation like that, it definitely makes more sense for a brand to select an agency. Um, and then also, additionally, just like consistency. If I don't need that role consistently, um, it's just a lot easier to outsource it to an agency. You're able to flex up resources, flex down needs. Um, and so, yeah, I would say like that's that's usually where my mind is at when when I'm selecting for whether to hire in house or or agency. Yeah, I know. I know. Oh, Charlie, go ahead. I'm sorry, yeah, I was just gonna ask a quick question on that. I think this is. Um... I could be its hole and podcast episodes where I have to get careful not to get in a hole and a ramble. But um, what's your view on, I guess, like, that's a great example. So you were on about in-house versus agency and for a content kind of role. Um, do you feel like one person can execute that? You know, you talk specifically about resource in terms of the requirements. Like if the requirements and the outputs are quite low, as in low enough that one person could in theory, output all of that, do you feel like one person can have enough like breadth of knowledge to be able to execute that well? It, it really depends, A, on the type of role and like what I'm asking for. Like I might be asking for a Swiss Army knife designer and in a situation like that, and if the consistency aspect is not there, then I would actually lean on a freelancer instead mm -hmm. of an agency or a full-time person. So cool. Dependent. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Yeah, and I know I had an episode with Ben from True Classic and some of the things that you said he was actually sharing as well, where it kind of comes into like speed of execution. And then he was referencing things like 3PL, where um, picking a few things that a business can be very good at and then outsourcing for the rest of the stuff. And it kind of sounds like that's where you were going with, uh, do we want to build an agency within the business or do we want to be able to bring somebody in that already has the processes, the people, all of that as well? Exactly. And I can I, quickly just reiterate, I mean, the sole purpose or like the things we want from an agency to kind of echo Ben's point is not only like a good price value um, mm -hmm. and speed and structure, but there also is required a level of flexibility and intuition with an agency. Mm -hmm. And that kind of speaks to just simply from a flexibility standpoint, the agency being able to scale up on needs and scale down on needs as they sort of arise and ebb and flow throughout the year, obviously, just given demand seasons and what have you, but also a level of intuition. I think that that's something that, you know, just to speak on the brand side, I've struggled with time and time again with hiring creative agencies is I'm oftentimes asked or I'm oftentimes kind of forced to sign on the dotted line before I'm able to get an answer as to like what the problems you see are, what you're going to really actually bring to the table, um, a full overview. And so I think successful agencies with us have been those agencies that have come knowing the problem um, from that first call, being so aware of what it is that our needs are. Um, and then being able to be flexible with our resources and our um, just like in-house yeah, abilities, I guess. So flexibility, intuition are, are pretty core parts of that. Yeah, that's very interesting you call that out. I'll, I'll speak from the agency side on that. And it may be that the answer is, well, actually, I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, in terms of telling what the problem is before, um, 
you know, that's something that we do. That's something that we've done is audits and provide detailed audits uh, for clients. One thing that I found in the past was when we gave too much information or in like the Sandler sales model is like putting all the candy on the table. They would end up ghosting because then clients would try and take that information you gave them and just do it themselves or like give it to their existing agency that way. So maybe kind of unpack that a little bit. Like, what does that look like to you to where you get enough information um, from an agency to understand I think I know what you're talking about because I have received, uh, you know, agency videos that are like loom links of just a walkthrough of all the things that we've done wrong, what they would do, this, that, and around. Mm -hmm. And I think what you need is just a verbal communication when you guys are in that first call. Oftentimes, mm -hmm. I don't think that that's hyper appropriate before the first initial call because, mm -hmm. especially if it's just like a cold reach out, which I've received. Mm -hmm times just like a cold reach out with an audit um oftentimes i'm like maybe i'm not ready for this even if i am maybe this is just too much you don't know the pipeline of what my needs are there's just mm -hmm. like a lot of assumptions that are put into that initial audit that i receive and so i think the most appropriate time to talk about that is when i'm seeking out the agency i'm the one outreaching or you can outreach to me but i'm the one looking and in that initial conversation, to be able to point to some of the problems. I don't need to know the solutions. I just need to know that you know what the problems mm. are, right? Um, and I think that oftentimes what I see is, you know, these are all your problems. This is how we're going to tackle them. Like, we got it. Go, go, go. And the reality is, like, you don't know my perspective of the problem. I like that you know the problem, but now we need to have a conversation about why we're at this problem and what the issues are. Because oftentimes, like... You don't know the ins and outs of how the brand is working, the pipeline of importance and where this lands in comparison, how this could affect a ripple effect of all of these other things. Um, and so, yeah, I think there is a, a very special balance to your point, Kobe. Like there, there has to be kind of a mutual back and forth in that discussion. It needs to feel like you can understand where I'm coming from, but not that you know better than me, if that makes sense. I yeah. think that's really important and I think yeah. that's such a good call out is and I've done brand and agency side but definitely way more agency and more recent experience and I've done a lot of these audits and been on the sales calls and you you are auditing with a really limited picture like we would usually not do an audit until we'd had that scoping call so we know that the client or lead is interested we know what their pain points are we've already kind of scoped it out we've tried to tease out okay why are you actually looking for another agency you know what is it that you're not getting at the moment and we will audit based on that but even then your own audit and your own opinion is always an echo chamber it's an echo chamber of like your lens of the world and of performance marketing or whatever it is that is the service that you're offering and I think that's such a key point is that yeah you don't, the, the person pitching doesn't always know your exact view of the problem. So coming in with all the solutions might be like completely the turn off that is going to, you know, make that lead go cold because actually you're kind of looking at it at an angle that really rubs them the wrong way. Totally. And I will also additionally add a little level to that in something that I receive from, um, from agencies, sorry, all the time is there will be this like, not necessarily a game of telephone, but it's one person away from the actual source. Mm -hmm. So usually I'll get a project manager who is communicating all of these things, right, that the dev and design team decided are like issues that they've compiled and they've put together. And so I will find <laughs> pretty often um, is that when I, you know, double down on a question, um, there is a lag because they're not mm -hmm. the that are solving this problem. And I think that that's a problem I've seen time and time and time again is leading with a PM that isn't a designer, or isn't a developer, or isn't a creative in and of themselves. Really, that kind of flops with agencies. But that blow just... Yeah. That, um, so that's on my list of red flags. Uh, project managers that don't have expertise because like you're saying, it creates that lag. And more often than not, kind of speaking in an overgeneralization here, but normally that means there's um, low cost talent doing the execution that may not be ready to be client facing. And so they have to have that barrier in between so that there is communication. But the problem with that still, even though that person is great at communication and project managers are so valuable and needed is from the agency side, um, 
the project manager, because they don't have expertise in that, can't always filter out feedback and, and requests from clients as well. So then sometimes the project can get derailed if we start going in a direction or if the agency were to start going in a direction that doesn't make sense for the tactical execution that way. So right. project management, big red flag. We talked about things you look for in the hiring process, but what other red flags are you looking for to avoid in the hiring process? Ooh, um these like ominous teams, very blurry teams. That's something that okay. always happens. I feel like um, I don't know who's assigned to the account, you know, mm. a lot of the time. That's not something that's extremely clear. I have like a lead creative strategist here, a project manager here, and none of them are actually the ones doing the work rather than getting me in like direct contact with the graphic designer to be like, okay, wait, let me just download you on what I want you to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there is a lack of that personability, I would say, between us and the team. And I think just that buffer away starts to create more and more and more distance. Um, so that's another red flag, I would say. It's just like th these kind of um, amorphous teams that we don't really understand who's in, who's out, who's working on it, who's not. Um, bloat. Oh, my God. Overly bloated teams. Uh, I feel like with agencies in particular, the reason why we want it is because, like, you know, we want the expertise. We want to get straight to the point. And I feel like a lot of agencies get very bloated very quickly the second that they start to get enough accounts. And then you have six designers working on one thing and many, many different people working on one thing. And the thing about creative is, you know, when someone else's hands have touched it. That's the thing about creative. Mm. You always know when it isn't that hand that has touched it. And that's so clear, like, especially as a person who has been a designer, been in UI UX, like I can see the pixel pushing. I can understand how different people design. And so when you don't have that consistency coming in from a consistent set of designers, from a consistent set of whoever it may be, um, it becomes extremely clear and starts falling apart extremely quickly. And so blow inconsistency, um, lack of transparency, those are kind of red flags that I would say <laughs> off bat with right. working with agencies. Um, and then uh, I think for creative in particular, um, a lot of the time, I think there's a healthy balance, of course, between numbers and creative. But oftentimes I'll look at a piece of creative and I'll be like, okay. And then I'll get numbers that are like highly, highly inflated with no explanation of where those numbers came from, like 840% increase in X, Y, Z, you know, mm -hmm. like attributed sales, let's say. Um, I don't know where that came from. I don't know what that's based on. I don't know the context. And so there's a lot mm -hmm. of data fishing that also exists within the creative space. And I think people get away with it in the creative space because a lot of creatives aren't very data savvy. Mm -hmm. um, but for those creatives like myself who are data savvy, you can spot right through that you know that becomes biggest red flag so yeah I, I would say those are those are some tangible red flags for you <laughs> i hope that answered the question yeah those are all good charlie did you have something uh from the last one yeah I'm, oh, okay yeah i think we found it on it cool well we've talked about red flags we've talked about the hiring process um all great things for me to hear and chew on so i'm sure any other agency owner listening is thinking the same from there, it goes into onboarding. Uh, what makes a good onboarding experience for you? Um, so I think also back to like these processes, structure is important, but flexibility is equally as important. And I feel like that is something that's often missed in a lot of agencies. They want to let you know that they are going to audit everything. They're going to look at all of your channels. They're going to run all these surveys. They're going to, and sometimes you have that. You don't need them to do that. Like a lot mm. of the time I actually have the strategy. I just need someone to help me execute and hold my hand through it. So I don't need you to like blow up again and inflate that whole first part of the process. And so something that I wish a lot of like agencies really knew is or really did and came to me with is just a checklist of like, what is it that you have? What is it that you don't have? What is it that you need? What is it that you don't need? What are the resources that exist? What don't exist? And see how they can create a flexible plan enough to plug into those gaps rather than repeating a lot of the same things that we may have. And, and I've worked in brands where, you know, those resources don't exist and those things are extremely valuable. And I do need a lot of a set of those onboarding materials and what have you and for you to run the qualitative testing and all that fun stuff. But, you know, working at a brand like True Classic, like 
we have teams on teams on teams. I don't need you to tell me my consumer insights. I know them up, down and around. Um, I need you to help me synthesize. I need you to push back on my strategy, actually, and just tell me, is it? do you think it's going to work or not from your expertise? Um, and so, yeah, I would say like there needs to be structure that allows for flexibility with onboarding. That's something that I have definitely experienced. And then just a very clear bulletproof timeline and then follow up with that timeline. How are you tracking? Give me, you know, because a lot of the time, I mean, I, I'm using organic social just because we just hired that agency right now for True Classic. I'm supporting them on a, on a part time basis. Um, but something that's extremely great is, you know, they handed over an entire timeline and they're going to do regular follow up, mm-hmm. actually show me because creative takes like about a month to create. Um, and I don't want to have my eyes closed until the end of that month. Mm-hmm. I want to see what's happening along the way. Like, I want to stop you in your tracks if you're going too far off the rails. Um, and I feel like nothing is more disappointing than an agency leaving for like two or three weeks to go work on this like grand master plan and coming to me and like being a complete flop. And now we waste. Mm-hmm. Weeks. I wish you had brought me a lot earlier. Um, so, yeah, I would say from an onboarding process, structure, flexibility. Um, and and clarity again back to the same I think, <laughs> I think was for me like in my experience what has been the silver bullet as an agency wanting to get this right is being dynamic and I will die on this hill and I love processes I am such a process person but your process doesn't work for every client and especially when it comes to creative client wants and needs vary so massively and if you assume a one size fix um fits all approach that's probably the only way that you are guaranteed to mess up or like damage the relationship or the kind of um expectation of you of yourself in that client's eyes because yeah they clients all just want something different and for me I think that goes back to the sales process. Like if we're in the onboarding phase and I don't already know that you've got the strategy and you just want me to help you synthesize it, I think that to me would be like, okay, I failed in the sales process here. Like I should have really understood her needs in the sales process, not in the onboarding. And that would be a real big kind of moment for me to be like, right, we need to look at the sales process and figure out how we missed that. Like how did we not know that? And it's not that those things can't be resolved in you know, those are just, I think, checkpoints where as an agency, you have to look at yourself and go, okay, we dang messed that up. Like we should have known that. Let's go and fix that for the next lead that comes through the pipeline. Um, I think that's like a real key part of it is doing the scoping in the sales process well enough to know what they want in the onboarding process and have already been dynamic and kind of adjusted what you're delivering based on what you found out in the sales process. And I think you touched on a very important point, which a lot of agencies also, yes, once we've had that feedback loop or once you guys have had that feedback loop of like, we kind of messed that up. um, I think there requires a level of like, of human interaction in that moment where we all understand we are all human. It's okay to make mistakes. I don't need an agency to pretend like they have, you know, a white halo around them. That mm-hmm. that's the other thing is like, you know, not being able to access the real human reaction and process within this full experience. Because again, when we go back to creative, it's so much about synergy. It's so much about, you know, like if I feel like I'm not being told something and you kind of drift off, you guys try to fix it again within your echo chamber. I'm not a part of that solution. You're not asking me what my needs are again. Then we fall back into that same cycle mm-hmm. over and over. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, what I've just seen more and more and more is that, like, brands really want to feel like the agency is in-house. I mean, Mm, the only reason we can't do this is because this is too many things to manage in-house. We have a kajillion other things to do. Hiring and building a full synergy creative team is hard. It takes a long time. There's a lot of trial and error. Um, Mm. And particularly with creative, you know, I'm not going to speak on behalf of a lot of different, like, specificities within like the agency world and e-commerce and and brands and what have you within creative I want to feel like you guys are like sitting in the room with me we are together in this this is you are an extension of our team and that can only happen if healthy feedback exists and Mm -hmm. accountability exists and improvements and you know that whole process must exist 
It's a really, really good point. And I think that I've seen a lot of agency pitches over the years of being in agency sales processes and the amount of times you hear, oh, we will be an extension of your team. Agencies know that that's what brands want to hear, but a lot of agencies don't know how to actually do that. And for me, it comes entirely down to relationship. Like if I can't say to you, I dang mess that up, then naturally that's a red flag for me for you as a client of like, okay, do we have a strong enough relationship and partnership with this client where we can be honest? Mm -hmm. Like, is that client going to hit the roof? Then actually that's maybe a red flag from us to the client because that's just as important. Like that relationship has to work both ways. And I think it just comes down to honesty, like sugarcoating the truth, you know, covering things up always fails. It always fails. Just go and say, hey, I dang messed that up, but here's how we're going to fix it like exactly. how do you feel about that is that like is that more aligned to what you need should we go down this direction great cool give yeah. us like three days and we're going to come back to you it's something amazing exactly exactly and maybe it means that you know the agency on their own expense like makes an adjustment or makes some sort of solution to show that they no. actually are invested in this long-term relationship um because yeah i think that like you said that's the, the, that's integral it's an integral part of the process everyone is human here you know so and that kind of plays into what you were saying where you were talking about creative takes a month creative has a timeline to it right there's a start and there's a finish and you don't want to wait until the very end to find out what the creative is going to look like and where it's going to go that's one thing that we have been um, kind of working through as an agency, we have a process, you know, high level that we follow. We have our onboarding call, we have an onboarding form, and then we do our 90 day testing plan and create our briefs and things like that. It can be contingent or it can be different from client to client in terms of how hands on or how kind of laissez faire they are with how much we push towards them or what type of feedback we ask. But um, that's one thing that we've been kind of going through is just having clients a little bit more involved in the uh, approval pre-production phase. So like the approval of the brief and seeing that so they can understand where we're going with things and try to show them examples of creatives that we've done in the past that might be the look or style. And there's also other ways. Um, you know, we talked to Sarah Levenger on an episode recently and she was talking about how she would use things like a Pinterest board and getting clients to create a Pinterest board with examples of creatives that she liked or that they like, so that she could understand that because we as an agency may have a vision for the creative. You as the client or the team uh, in-house may have a vision for it. And so performance with performance creative is what we're going after, but it's also making sure that we design creative that meets the look that you're going for. And if there's no communication up until that point, um, it's going to be a big kind of sticker shock, if you will, when you open that Google Drive or whatever it is, and you just see a creative that looks nothing like you were expecting that way. So uh -huh. all that to say, um, what do you like experience wise when it comes to that first brief or two of like really being kind of involved to make sure that things don't go far left or far right? Um, I mean, definitely mood boards are, are key here. I know, you know, they've they come in trend and out of trend and we mm. we fluctuate through the uses of mood boards but to me i mean as a as a visual um as a visual learner as a visual person like nothing is going to explain to me what you're going for more than examples and you can like obviously pinpoint parts of the examples and tell me about them i have the creativity and the imagination to see what that looks like in my brain um and so i think one thing though i do want to say is it really depends who you're speaking with and it really depends who the client is in that situation. Because if it were me, an actual creative director, then yes, we can get into the weeds. Let's co-create a Pinterest board. I know what I want to create. Like, let's have that download with each other. Um, let's see how you're able to use our brand assets, our, you know, our icons. Like, show me an example of how you're able to put that together, even if it's one single ad. Um but obviously, if you're working with a non-creative, it looks extremely different um, because at that point, you do kind of have to enter back into your like download mode of really trying to understand that client's like needs, put their brain on <laughs> and try to see what it is that they want. And I think what I like to what I like, like what I like seeing is 
as much as I like seeing what it's going to look like, I like seeing what it's not going to look like. That's also an important part to me. Like sometimes, and I've seen this um, with a few different creative partners, they'll be like, you know, this is the aesthetic of some of your competitors, for example, which oftentimes is like the landscape that you're looking at. We are not going to do these things. This is how we're not going to be like that which is pretty important for me to see because sometimes, you know, we will go through the mood boarding process, but sometimes I'll end up back in what I don't want to see. And so we need to like deduce and, and really use that structure to figure out what the yeses are and what the no's are and really talk through that together. Like I think a creative brainstorm call is like super integral to have as you know the lead creative on their team the lead creative on our team you guys just go at it for an hour and a half two hours just really workshop exactly what yeah. your needs are um and then from that point on you can go but again i usually a lot of these onboarding calls have the whole team on it and i have my ceo on and now i can't really speak in full transparency about or the ins and outs and the weeds because other people are not relevant to that conversation mm -hmm. um so allowing room for workshops to exist, I think, is something that I haven't seen as often in, in client brand relationships, but something I would like to see a little bit more often, at least in the onboarding phases. Yeah, yeah I have to kind of, I guess, air out um, what might be a something that we could fix on our side, because this is something that, um, you know, I've kind of thought through when we provide creative, we provide creative strategy and creative. And I think one thing we may have done Poorly, as you were talking about um, pivoting or being flexible with your service and understanding, like if they already have a strategy, then there's no need for the research and there's no need for all that. It just needs to turn into execution. Um, one fear, I guess I would say that we've had is like if we turn into a button pushing agency of just designing, then we don't own the strategy. And if the performance of the creative is bad in terms of ROA or CPA or something like that, that's what we're being graded on. So will we then have a, a, a shorter lifetime with a client if the performance is not there? And so I'm just kind of, I guess, talking out loud and turning this into a therapy session, but- um, I hear you. Yeah. I, I, I think the key here is, is, is testing. I mean, something that, you know, there is no creativity without limitations. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really true in and of itself. And so if you don't create variables to constantly be testing, like which is something that we're doing as an internal team, you will inevitably fall flat. And that is how so many of our creative agencies that we've partnered with in the, in the past fallen flat is because they've held onto a strategy. They knew they made it work. They own that strategy. They stuck mm -hmm. with it got kind of lazy now we're executing the same strategy over and over and over again and there isn't really that iterative kind of aspect to it i think the ask is always that you challenge our strategy and show mm -hmm. me that you can do it you know i'm telling you what i think can work from living and breathing in the brand but i need you to come back to me and be like okay i know what you said worked we're also going to test all these other things in tandem because also things that work work for a period of time nothing works mm -hmm. for forever so mm -hmm. like there must be an iterative, um, I guess, um, essence to the entire process of building creative strategy, of continuing to test, of seeing what does work, what doesn't work. And I think that's what keeps the agency fresh, is being able to adopt the things that we need, bring their things to the table, and we're constantly testing things against each other. And it's great if the brand's ideas work, use that jumping off point and actually build some new concepts that kind of iterate on that idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, there needs to be kind of like this living ecosystem, I want to say, that exists between the brand and the agency, because we are coming from a very valuable standpoint. You guys are coming from a very valuable standpoint, and it shouldn't be a competition. It should be a, a continuous mm -hmm. iteration. Loop. Oh, yeah. You know? It's a partnership. Like, mm -hmm. even if, you know, we as an agency kind of tell you, we're going to be an extension of your team, like the, all that being said, and that should be true, like the for from my experience the best agency client relationships i've been a part of are where it is a partnership like you have so much value as the brand to bring because we don't have the brand background that you do we've got experience as an agency across multiple different clients within your vertical or whatever that we can bring those fresh ideas and i think that is exactly where the magic happens is when you properly properly collaborate and you take the ego out of the room you keep that humility that you were mentioning before and like 
that one and a half, two hour brain session where you just go at it in your words. I want to be in that room with you. Like that would be such a fun like session. I would love to do that. Um, but I think it, and it, it, for me, like it, again, it all comes back to being dynamic because you need to understand what, as an agency, I feel like you need to really understand what the client wants in order to, how can you possibly kind of score a goal if you don't know where the goalposts are, right? If you don't ask those questions and understand, then there's no way you're going to win. And, you know, I've worked with a brand before who, um, they were a skincare brand and they were doing really well and they brought us in for creative and we had like, you know, a pre-production proposal that we would send with examples this is the messaging angles that we're going with we're going to use these kind of concepts like it's going to look a bit like this and then we used to do that before it goes to the designer so then you have less amends on the other side and that for 75 80 percent of clients worked really really well this one client was like i'm paying you to do this you are asking me for too much input like i don't want to input i've hired you because i want your expertise and we nearly lost the client over it and i was like okay i hear you right we're pivoting let's be dynamic like we're not going to have three rounds of approval with this client there's one like you just do it and you give it to her that's it like don't bring her in when she doesn't need to be in right we need to adjust the kind of approach here and i think like I talk about this a lot with media buying it is a bit more kind of like one size fits all and a bit less personal but with the creative brands operate so so differently and it is a massive challenge as an agency because it makes it really hard to forecast how much work you've got to spend like you know how much time you've got to spend on certain parts of the process but that's agency problem to worry about you know that sounds like an us problem that's not a you problem that's the brand so like we have to find a way to solve that yeah and i think here here's also something that you touched on you touched on like giving examples to brands and being like i mean that that kind of sorry if i'm going off on a tangent but this is something i've also gotten from agencies a lot is um too many options or like now i have to make like yeah. for example three different creative production ideas where is the one i want the one creative production idea if i don't like it go back and like give me a backup option but don't introduce three different solutions to me mm. I think that, oh that's something i get again and again and again with agencies is this three solution like umbrella of like you can pick one of these three options and i think that goes back to the expertise portion like i'm hiring mm. you to give me your opinion as well yeah. like i want to know what you think is going to work best because now i might pick one of the three and now I chose it and you can be like, oh, well, our team kind of did prefer this one other concept and now we're here, uh, which has happened yeah. in the past. And so something that even now as I transition into more of the agency side, I never give more than one option. I have option two and three as backup in my back pocket and those exist in case this has seen incredible rejection. But if I did like the pre-work well enough. I shouldn't have three options to give you. I should have like my top solution that I am bringing. To totally you. agree. Yeah. And that's how I like to operate with it is like, I, we don't really send stuff necessarily for approval. Mm -hmm. It's your chance to feedback absolutely and say no, but I'm not really looking for your critique here. And that's kind of like an important distinction. And it is a tricky one to handle from a relationship perspective without seeming like a complete a-hole. But um, it's quite often I kind of angle it as like, FYI, this is the direction that we're taking. Let us know if you see any issues. It's kind of like the way I kind of I angle it. And so it's now's your chance to speak up if you think we're going completely right or left when we shouldn't be. But this is what we're doing because we're the experts and it's not arrogance. It's just, it's not. hey, this, this is where we're going. Like, this is what you've hired us to do. We're doing we're doing it. Um, yeah. like, jump in if you don't love it. Exactly. Totally. I love that. Keep doing that to all the to all the <laughs> agencies out there. Do that. <laughs> and I know we're coming to the top of the recording here. I have one more kind of main question before we go into our last three rapid fire. But um, the term scope creep, when you hear the term scope creep, what's your first thoughts? How do you feel about that? <sighs> um, I mean, uh, what are my first thoughts? My first thoughts are, did you not scope this well enough? Mm. That's always my first thought. That's as a brand, right? I'm speaking on behalf, behalf of the brand. If they feel like they, like I'm imposing some sort of like additional scope onto them, like that's something. Brand that... imposing scope onto the agency. Correct. Okay. If the brand is imposing scope onto the agency, 
and the agency is like, oh no, like this is completely out of scope, then then there needs to be a larger conversation. It's not just it ends there. Mm -hmm. That's something that always happens because then there was an onboarding mishap. There was a miscommunication that was happening. Um, That happens pretty often as well is saying like, oh no, this is out of scope. And then the brand responds, what do you mean? This is out of scope. Mm -hmm. Could you give an example? What's something Mm -hmm. that you would use as an example for that? That's common. Because I'm thinking like, oh God, when have I said that? And (laughs) was was I out of line? (laughs) Well, I mean, it's, uh, let me think of an example. An example uh, is, you know, I, I want you guys to, to shoot this one product, you know, response video for us. Like, this is something that is like within the scope and they're like, no, we just are here for strategy and we will work with your like content creators to actually like build that, but we're not going to do it ourselves. That's an example of like, you know, consider it out of scope but you guys have quoted us that you're going to be creating content mm-hmm. for us net new. Yeah. Situation- and if the agency pitched and they, and you know that they do have production skills, exactly. but they've just said, hey, we can do it, but we're not. And then they charge me extra for this request that is assumed to be this like, you know, kind of far left request. In a moment like that, I think it's super essential to have a regrounding conversation about what the scope really is and what the limitations really are. And I think some of the problem with that is when you're locked into like a three month contract, which also kind of breaks it because now, okay, now you guys believe that you are working out of scope. These are the parameters I'm capable or like these are the resources I'm able to put in. This is the budget I'm able to put in for the next three months. Now we're stuck together, which happens, you know, so Mm -hmm. you guys aren't happy. I'm not happy. What happens now? And I think Mm -hmm. that that has to come from the client side or sorry the the agency side that there needs to be some flexibility when situations like that arise to modify the 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 you know work agreement between the two to create a healthy middle um or to eliminate it early which is something Mm -hmm. that i also don't see very often is that like you know we're holding on we want this account for x amount we're gonna take this much money from you i'm not getting what i want you're kind of you're on your way out in my mind is usually how it goes. And that's how a lot of actual like, you know, clients or uh, sorry, a lot of other agencies have fizzled out with us as well. It's just this idea that, you know, we are asking them for too much, but they weren't clear with what that too much is. And, mm, what we're asking yeah. this, you know, we're now we're just getting this new number that we're asked to pay. We don't understand, you know, uh, obviously Specifically, when you're speaking to executives that are not creatives, you're like, oh, I need an additional 15K a month just for like production pur- purposes. They don't know where that's going, right? They don't know how how that's being allocated. Why is it just like, you know, a double in, in the cost for just like three extra videos? Like there isn't that transparency that really comes in through the pipeline. Um, and I think that goes back to so much of what we were saying earlier is just that flexibility, but also transparency around what the resources mm-hmm. are, and what the tangible outputs are. And that's been the most successful relationships is just knowing exactly how much output, like how many deliverables am I getting a month? What, how many net new deliverables am I getting? How much are you repurposing from our content? So on and so forth. And so that's kind of how scope creep like pops up in my in my experience. Mm-hmm. But I'm curious if you experience scope creep in a different capacity. Well, I think it comes back to humility again, and it's just having that human conversation. And I think enough agent, I don't think enough agencies in my experience are open enough. Like if if that happened, like I've been an agency before, where we've said we've sat down with a client if it was with a good relationship, and they've said something and we've said it's scope creep and they were really unhappy we would say look we've charged this amount because it costs us xyz to do this and so if we do that we're actually going to be like you know x out of pocket and we just can't afford to do that so is there something we can do in the middle like maybe we swap this service that you don't care about as much and we do the thing that you want that we feel is scope creep instead of that like how can we still give you what you want without us losing money without you having to spend loads more money and without everybody just walking away feeling really pissed off because you it's a partnership and you everyone should want it to succeed but it is really challenging because if the client feels like something was miscommunicated then like that's kind of always going to be the agency's fault 
in the client's eyes, of course, and I mean, the agency, I'm sure, were like, no, we said this and it's in the contract. Yeah, well, no one reads the contract. So like something's gone wrong somewhere and that would be another moment of, okay, how can we make sure this doesn't happen again? But is it salvageable? From an agency perspective, I'd be thinking, can we salvage this relationship and should we try? Or are we just going to run ourselves into the ground and like, you know, over deliver for this three months for them to just fire us anyway. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think from my perspective, the, the biggest time scope creep comes a problem that's worth mentioning. Cause there's times where we'll just do things that go a little bit outside of what we normally do just to deliver for sake of performances. Like, let's say, um, you know, the brand has a videographer or something that works in house that does stuff, but the videographer decides they want to send or photographer wants to send photos that have not been rendered properly or videos that have not been color graded and stuff like that. So then we have to spend additional time color grading somebody else's work and making sure it fits the brand and all that type of stuff. Or just, I don't know how to word it else, but like from a physical brand standpoint, like when an ask from a client feels like if they wanted two t-shirts for the price of one, when it comes to like our services, you know what I mean? Like when they start asking for a lot of additional deliverables that they very clearly know that they aren't supposed to be getting that way. Um, yeah. That just is my thoughts on scope creep that way. I hear that. I'm, I feel like I'm going to probably experience that a lot now being on the agency side. <laughs> so I'll report back with how I try to solve. <laughs> oh, please do. Oh, I'd love to hear it. No, it's, and it's hard because you are, you know, being paid for your services and that can be really tricky in, if you're working with a bad partner and you, the thing is like as an agency, you see those red flags really early on. Like if they feel like they're hiring you and they own you and you can tell when it's not going to be a partnership, like, and very often we just won't, we'll either pitch a price that's ridiculously high. And if they take it, then cool. But, or we'll just say, Do you know what? This isn't a fit. And most of the time it's, this isn't a fit. Yeah. And you just kind of like walk away because it really is a partnership, but ultimately you are providing services to a brand and brands will push the boundaries a little bit sometimes because they might say, oh, I just really need a version of that where that hook is slightly different. Can you just throw it in? And it's like, well, that's a new video, completely new video that's going to, my graphic designer's got to edit that. He's got to export it. And yeah, you might think that takes like 10 or 15 minutes and maybe it does. But if you ask for that two or three times a month, like you're just pushing it then. And that becomes really difficult as the agency to like set that boundary without causing friction in the relationship i hear that and i will mirror that that also exists within the brand as well mm. like even with mm. creatives within a brand when you get non-creatives that are coming at you like hey okay we're actually changing this promotion to x y and z you have 45 different ad sets that now we have to go swap one number in right mm. so oh my God. like there yeah. is there is like this understanding i think across the board and i I still haven't figured out the best way, I will be completely honest, to speak with non-creatives about what that lift actually looks like, because that isn't considered. And I do agree and resonate with that, that that's not mm -hmm. on the client side or sorry, the agency. I keep saying client. That's not just on the agency side. That's happening in house. That That's a regular. Yeah. yeah. And I think the biggest difference between the two, and then I'll segue into our final rapid fire questions is from the brand side when it happens in the brand it affects the brand and that that is where the impact resonates and that's where it stays on the agency side one thing we would just try and tell clients is look like we're we're open to pivoting we're open to being flexible we want to make sure performance is there but we respect your account as much as we respect everyone else's accounts and so if every single client of ours was asking for additional scope or additional that or change timelines or this or that um we would all lose sleep and hair, but then our clients, you know, would be impacted as well. So if, if effects from one account starts affecting multiple other accounts, then as an agency, mm -hmm. we're failing, right? And it's not doing well. So it's not even necessarily always keeping scope creep from one specific client. It's just keeping an even respect for all accounts and making sure that everybody's getting equal attention, equal time, and those things as well. And I equal will... scope creep allowed. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like you have to have like a a percentage or like an error margin or however yeah. you call it. As an agency, you must like kind of under promise over deliver in that mm -hmm. kind of situation of just always allowing for that tiny bit of scope creep, but then understanding as an agency when you cut it off, mm -hmm. um, you know, 
because I agree that that happens. That's inevitable. Well, if you had to summarize everything we've discussed today into a marketing mindset, what mindset should marketers or business owners have? Oof. Um, that, oh, that, that, that's a, that's a, a good way of reframing it. So I'm putting on my, my marketing hat. Um, I would say that creative agencies more than any other sort of partnership should feel like an extension of your team. And if it doesn't feel like an extension of your team, you guys need to have a conversation again and reestablish what the partnership looks like. That's something that's extremely necessary to really acknowledge is that creative also is, even if it is paid creative, there is a humanistic portion of it that needs to exist because they are creating something. Creation is you know, it's, it's, it's not mathematical. You can't ever quantify it in the same sorts of ways. So there needs to be that like human synergy that exists. There needs to be room for error and mistakes, but equally there needs to be room for accountability and improvements and feedback. Um, transparency, flexibility, dynamic, like you said, I think those are very important elements about when, when considering a partnership, particularly a creative partnership. Um, and then I think regular check-ins like regular one-on-one check-ins are pretty important and I mean that by like there needs to be a point where my designer and your designer are able to quickly speak to each other maybe once a month or once every couple months there needs to be a point where you know I'm able to just sit with the lead strategist in a room the two of us alone and have a conversation Um, and I think a lot of the time that doesn't happen. The space for that doesn't really exist because we are trying to like optimize for these like just reporting meetings where you just hear all the things, but that workshopping doesn't exist. And I think that that ultimately fizzles out any relationship with creative agencies and the brand. And so for the marketing team, I guess it's important to know that having an in-house creative representative is pretty critical, I would say. Um, as a marketer completely outsourcing creative is impossible Um, so you can't just have like six agencies working for you and not a single in-house creative Um, and yeah agencies should be nimble they should be flexible they should be dynamic they should shift so I love it and for anyone listening that's in the stage of figuring out what they'd like to do in the creative industry what creative roles or marketing roles do you think will have the highest demand opportunity in the next three to five years? Ooh, um, I think with the rise of AI, I'm, I'm, I'm quite interested to see how um, the sort of, you know, how the execution kind of starts to ripple. So like, I think the first thing I see kind of eliminating over the next maybe 10 years is Um, just executional designers on like a very like fundamental scale within brand, Mm -hmm. not within Mm -hmm. age in particular, because there will always be a need. That's really interesting. So you have a design background and you think AI will mean that design roles are the first to go. I do think so because if I can, if I, it is logical what I can feed it. If I can feed it a very Mm -hmm. good enough mood board, my style, Mm -hmm. train it to what I want it to look like and what I don't want it to look like. I don't see any reason why they can't adopt that. However, what I will say is super hard to find is strategy and like a person or people that are actually extremely intuitive and extremely creative. Um, And so it's actually interesting. All like the very pixel pushing kind of roles I see kind of fizzling out of brands over time. And I'm even seeing it now. Um, Whereas the the creative strategy roles, whether it be, you know, you're a paid media strategist on the content side, or if it means you are, you know, a creative director or an art director or a content creator, like those actually, to me, are probably the most integral roles that are going to be very, very hard to replace in the next few years. And so, yeah, that's yeah. something as an agency we've talked about. Same with media buying, you know, Phil, over the next three to five years or so. Tactical media buyers are going to be less and less. It's going to be more about strategy and knowing how to connect the actions with the business and the impact that way. Um, a, a thought that came up as you were saying that is like examples like Figma, where there's text to Figma plugins now where you can give Figma a or the plugin a screenshot of an example of what you want design, type what you want, 
And then within 10 seconds, it designs that for you, which Charlie, I have not showed you that yet. Um, we should look at that for Figma uh, as well, because I've been using right. that for some dashboard building. Um, cool. Ooh, last question for you. Uh, tell us where can listeners connect with you and learn more about yourself? Oh, um, listeners can connect with me either on my social media or my personal website. Um, I my 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 agency brand, which I just launched recently, um, is called <laughs> Double D. Actually, Double D by Dina. So that kind of just speaks to my multiple hats that I wear in creative strategy in general. So feel free to check that out and feel free to reach out to me on Double D by Dina is my Instagram, um, or email me straight through my site or LinkedIn. You'll find me. Well, Dina, we appreciate you coming on. I feel like this was a very insightful education or education call for me. Uh, had some education <laughs> there. Uh, so appreciate you coming on and chatting with us. Yeah, same. This was a really great connection. Thank you both.